o au amor e unde mi la cheva ca pa tu mai mauri ca tot te o ta ma ta tua o toro te ariki e te rana tira tua ke ana to to ti pun na ko toro e tua ke ki te pakita la e buka na na mai apoi la de la ai te rana tira mai tu hoi na ti ka u mi ki wai da pa na ti ti pore to ガリタクミキャポルタルカヤコココルカイラミコトナワイワイカイカポアコタノノアチタチタポテランコルタルイマヒママヒコカヒラヒライテアネイコネテロモアモテアオキャホヒアキテロモ Kia hora hia ki te kura, kia tāhene te tāhua, kia tā mau a te rongo taketake, kia katia te tatau i kaunamu, wene ngā tikanga a kua mā kui mā, e mau ana mā tau, tātau hoki, a i nei rā, whakamutunga, i mui te hoki mā mai a te mihai, a rā kui kreit, a rā, ko tāmi nui aru. Inu mai te rā whakāro, te whakapono, ngā tīmana ko me te aroha, te atua, kia kā kau tau, inu mai te huarahi, i hi koe aere, a tāne nui arangi i tōna piki tanga ki ngā rangi tū hāha ki te tihio manon. I roko hanga atu rā, ko i o matu a kore anaki, i riro ai, i ho ai mā kete, o te wānonga, ko te kete tua uri, ko te kete tua atea, ko te kete aro nui. He rau to i tau a kete aro nui, Ko ngā tīkanga o te rongo mai, ngā tīkanga whakai o tangata ki te rā. Ta reira kia pā kotau, i rume o kotau mai i hoho rongo. Ta reira, ka reto rote koro i tēnei wā ko te tūmanako, kia kā kia u kia mana wanui i rume i tēnei hikoi, haere, tai atu rā i te taumatau o te oranga. E ki ana te kore rua te tohunga, I noho nei, ki roto i tēnei whare, nga kōrero, tikanga, e pāna ki ēnei taonga tiku iho, nga mātua tikuna. Ara, ko tāma i taurima, tēnei kōre. Kia hora te narino, kia whakapapapau nga mute moana, kia tere te kāro ki rohi, i mua i tō huara. Reira, ko tau mā, ku parata, O ku whānau, tēnā kātau, tēnā kātau, kuri noa ki tō tātou nei whare tēnā tātou katoa. Nga tīno mō mai! Uiye! Ho hia ko te rongo, ho la hia ko te kūra, ho hoa kēra! Ko te rongo a mārai, ko te rongo a whare, ki ngā tō pito katoa, ho te aue! Tā hia nei te tā hua! Whakawhirina i hita maera i te i te kahurangi e ke anga i te eke Kia ta maua i ta rong taketake Arei a tēnā koe tau, tēnā koe tau Huri noa, huri noa ki tō tātou nei whane tēnā tātou katoa
de fapt, urmat urmă ce trebuie, ce ne mată la comitia o comună, tu a tinei uitorul, tinei hata. Că mă imiți mă atău, mă atău, pe care o chiar cu ei mă mănâncă tăi nu te la, mă mănâncă tăi nu pe oamenii a mă atău, tăi nu a făcut că o mă atău, fană, fană, îi tăia cea că o mă atău ne taină, cu a hină o copii. Mere de pa, atu i fără hia, mă mă atău tinei, cu i huinga, rumo nui, că fai a pe te rumo mă atău ne, Na rene te matua whakatau i tu mai hirunga i tenei rōpū a tō wairua ki Arataki, e Afina, e Manaaki, e Tiaki, nā ki Tia hoki, a pai kōrero, kōrero hana rana ki te e kaupa potera. Nā ki Tia mai a Taringa, mātau e Ramunana ki ngā kupu e Kohimuhumana, te tami o te wairua nga rira e te matua tene te mihi kia koe mau mo tō aru ka noa me te te mana ki tama hoki a tau tama kona hāhi ka tau ano i ene i rā whakumutunga i te matakato te whenua ka vita e hoki ana mātou mō te poropiti nei hana mana kōrero te māngai o te atua Nā reira, tēnei te mātou i noi kia koe e tēnei wā i dunga i te ingoa o ihu krai te tumata ne whaka tai whakaora. Āmen. You can speak English now. So all that was to say something very simple. Well, it took a little while, but just one word. But if you're doing it properly, that's the way to do it. We'd like to recognize uh, um, a very, <coughs> very special person, especially this morning, who took the time to join us as the Vice President of Operations of Polynesian Culture Center and stood to welcome you as our visitors from afar. Um, and that's our Senior Vice President, Nelson Moy. So I'd like to first acknowledge her, her uh, Araba. This place was the place where she started her work at the Polynesian Cultural Center as a demonstrator guy, twirling the poi. <laughs> now she stands as the vice president who tells me what to do, <laughs> and I tell the people what to do with the poi as well. <laughs> she still got her finger on the poi. So uh, uh, we've got uh, some family here from BYU Hawaii, previous students, uh, and um, and family, um, so we we express that uh, that welcome to all of you in this space of Ahu Moai, which is the safe, cozy haven we refer to as the pool or the womb of our fire on Mother Earth. And that's the symbolism of this place. And so here there is normal, here there is peace, Kamata, peace established and spread. Um, Along with uh, all of your words that we've spoken today, we hope you enjoy your time here as you listen also to the impressions of the Spirit and what each of us can do individually, collectively, as we move the work of the Lord forward. So I acknowledge that chair and how we you here amongst us um, and the crew who uh, were here early hours, late hours last night, early hours, um, and all of your support of the Polynesian Culture Center. We hope to see you sometime throughout the afternoon. We do a performance here on the stage. But we're okay, particularly. Um, and we, uh, we'll do our best for you as you come in and join us and the rest of the islands of Polynesia. Well, the good part is, is that all the formalities are done so I can just go straight into English um, to all of you today. But let me begin by saying aloha. aloha. Um, sitting here, I can't think of a better place to have a conference on peace building. Kim mentioned that this is the domain of rongo. In our culture, inside this building, there is 
no arguing. People must leave here with a consensus because Rongo, or the God of peace, this is his domain. The carvings you see represent ancestors. There's a carving that hopefully you can see that goes right around the whole building. It isn't even broken by the door. It goes above the door. It goes across there. It goes right around and above the door at the back as well. That is called papaka. Papaka is a crab. And what it is doing, it's grabbing the ankles of our ancestors and it's telling them to be unified, to be one. So meetings in these buildings didn't end until there was consensus. And so people had to use wisdom. People were, would sit at the feet of their ancestors, look across at people who were sitting underneath their ancestors and remember to see their humanity. Remember to see not only them, but those who went before them and who they represent. And so they had to open their hearts and minds to leave here without any conflict. That doesn't count as part of my 15 minutes, Sydney. I wasn't supposed to say that. Uh, <coughs> it just came out. Anyway, I am um, thankful for the opportunity to be here. Hopefully this is working. Is it on that way? Yeah, it is. I want to start with a quote. Um, so thankful to have a chance to meet uh, Dave and Patrick and um, recognize now the, uh, the men who put together this amazing book. Grateful to, uh, in these last couple of days to have a chance to read from its pages and learn. There's one point I want to point out when we start talking about our topic today of practicing. So Latter-day Saints do not need to wait for the church to create a peace-building department in Salt Lake City. We already have a clear commandment to proclaim peace. And the best place to start is where we are. I want to take you on a little journey into the Polynesian Cultural Center's journey, um, into the company culture. And I'll start briefly by... And of course, I'm going to jump over a whole bunch of years. But the Cultural Center opened in 1963 um, as a living museum and quickly became the number one attraction in Hawaii. Still is to this day. You may be surprised to know that it took 21 years for a mission statement to be created. And you'd be thinking, well, they were successful from the beginning and they didn't need a mission statement, but how did they become so successful? Well, without having a mission statement, what the Cultural Center had were visions. Visions of David O. McKay. They had a, um, a dedicatory prayer by Hubie Brown. They pointed out what we were supposed to be. We were supposed to be a place we'd, we would create leaders. We were supposed to be a place that if the whole world could see the nations of Polynesia and what we were about to share, then the world would have peace. That's what Hubie Brown blessed this place to be. After 10 years later, cultural beliefs were put in place. Now, uh, in 19, 2013, 1913, 2013, Alfred Grace became the CEO. Significance of Alfred Grace is that he was the first president to come from within. All our pre presidents prior to him and CEOs had been appointed mainly from Salt Lake City, from Utah. Alfred was the first to come and work here as a student and work through different departments and then become the CEO. We all wanted him to succeed. And, and he has. We're all very proud of him. Um, almost 10 years ago when he was made the CEO. A couple of years after uh, he was made the CEO, there was a purpose statement put together and it was led by Chad. Chad led a discussion um, in the boardroom, in our old boardroom with a handful of leaders to put together what is the purpose of the Polynesian Cultural Center. I was fortunate to be in that meeting and I'm grateful to see the the minds turning and the hearts being knitted together, woven together, to come up with four words. One ohana, sharing aloha, is the purpose of this special place. One group, one family, sharing aloha. Now, you've probably heard aloha 200 times since you got here, if you're visiting. Um, it is a greeting word, it is a farewell, and it does mean love, pure love. But we adopted at the cultural center a definition given to us by two kumahula, two cultural specialists, Keith R. Y. and Cy Bridges. They taught us that alo means in the presence of. And the presence we're speaking about is the presence of deity. Because in the presence of deity, man received ha, the breath of life. So when we say aloha at the Polynesian Cultural Center, we want people to feel aloha. What does it mean? I am literally making a commitment to you 
when I say aloha, I am saying to you, how can I bless your life? How do I help you in your life's journey? How can I, through your interaction with me, bring you back into the presence of deity, of ha? A scholar in New Zealand named Timo Te Karatu, probably the most prolific language specialist in our, language, in our culture, said that language is the key to understanding. Therefore, if you want to understand a culture, learn language. Good place to start is with proverbial statements. I'm going to come back to that. But what ended up happening in 2015, I met with Alfred Grace, sorry, I met with Alfred Grace, this had a real flash animation yesterday, but sorry, it's gone. Um, but he, I asked him, what would you like me to do? I'd just been hired in HR as the Director of Talent Management. I have no HR qualifications. I have no HR background. But he asked me to meet with him, and I asked him, what do you want me to do? He said, we have too many kingdoms. In other words, there's a conflict happening in the cultural center. You see, facilities are focusing on trades and building skills in their employees. Restaurant services are bringing in keynote speakers every month and learning different skills from different companies and organizations. Um, the guest services are focusing on their tours and cultural content. In the islands, we had already started using the principles of Arbinger. Sales and marketing were holding on to ideas from Seven Habits and Franklin Covey. Human resources were just trying to survive. <laughs> finances were doing nothing. No. Uh, <laughs> finances we were, were focusing on other things, especially uh, making sure we were staying afloat. And the theatre and other cultural presentations were using cultural content to use it for employee development. He said, align us. Take us back to our purpose. Um, there is, oh, I'm not sure what's happening with my clicker, Sydney, but take those minutes off. <coughs> so from the purpose statement, we put together the Ohana training, a small group of people, Chad Ford, David Whippy, myself, Kim Makako, and a handful of brilliant um, field directors from the International um, Cultural Peace Building major. David and McKay Center. We put together Ohana, an Ohana training, six modules. It took us six months, maybe nine. Um, we, from that came a new company orientation, a new handbook, and I could go on of all the different things that it, it became. It became uh, um, reading your supervisor. Our evaluations changed. And there is a quote I want to share with you from a book named B 2.0 by Jim Collins. He said, consider any great organization, one that has lasted over the years, Sorry, putting on my HR head here. And I think you will find that it owes its resilience to a power of what it calls beliefs and the appeal these beliefs have to its people. So we took these beliefs and we put them into values. You can say that already existed in Polynesia. Okay, Sydney, what's happening? Another quote from Jim Collins um, and William Lazier. Human beings respond to values, ideals, dreams, and exhilarating challenges. It's our nature. We will go to phenomenal lengths in an effort to live up to the ideal of an organization, peers, group, or society if we share those ideals and consider them worthy. I love that quote at the end of this because I remember sitting in my first workshop with Chad right here in this meeting house and he told us a funny story of no matter where he's traveled in the world, whether he's talking to Palestinians, to those who are Arabic, to speaking to Christians, or Muslims, Jewish people, there was a common denominator out of every meeting and gathering that people would say to Chad, this is our culture. This is what it is to be Muslim. This is what it is to be Jewish. And why I laughed at that, because I was sitting there thinking, this is Maori. This is Polynesian culture. And there were these ideals that I knew we owned and they belong in all cultures. In every culture, there are principles of peace building. There are principles of success. Our PCC Ohana training, the first thing we did was we defined culture. And the culture that's still taught to this day in PCC orientation is it's the lens through which we see the world. It's the lens through which we see and understand each other. Now, we understand this lens we're talking about isn't just with our eyes, but what the Hawaiian people call na'au, 
with our soul. We understand that every conversation, every um, handshake, every glance we give people, those behaviors are impacted by how you see the person. So we started putting together six trainings. They all had principles that were come from, they come from Polynesia. You've already learned from Isaiah yesterday about what Lai is. And so we asked them, we challenged the company, how do we see Lai? And if you see it as a wahi kapu, a sacred place, sacred space, as a pu'uhono, a place of refuge, what's the appropriate behavior? Would we yell at people? Would we belittle somebody? Would we use them as tools? Would we ignore them as irrelevancies? Or do you see people who are escaping just as the ancients did? People escape to Lai today. They don't think they're escaping, but they are. They're escaping their, their mortgages. They're escaping their bosses. They're escaping their lives, their reality. If you see them as these people who have these aspirations, goals, but also are facing challenges like we are, how then would we look after them? How then would we see them and treat them? Uh, as you go through each of these values or these, these trainings, there are values of ifonga, like you learned yesterday, that's in si ohana. Uh, in PCC is the value of malama, to cherish people, cherish them. What does that look like? Uh, in seeing prophets, we learned about tauhi va. The Tongan people have this value for over thousands of years of nurturing the space between each other, as we learned from um, Dr. Kaili. We got to see aloha, and President Grace said, Seamus, you're missing one. I said, what is it? He said, CBYU Hawaii. How do we see that as the cultural center? And we had just come through a, I'll use the word rough, transition from one leadership to the next. And so we taught, um, what does it mean? Is it us versus them? Is it self-preservation or us preservation? Was taught in uh, CBYU and lastly C Mana was our leadership development. So f today I work at DoTerra. It's where I am. I have in me ideas uh, of peace building. I was shown here the six cultural beliefs, core values of DoTerra when I started there last August. Take ownership, earn trust, use good judgment, constantly improve, have an outward mindset. I, I like that one. Um, be customer obsessed. I asked the vice president, are you open to change? He said, why? And I said, because I think these are behaviors. Can we focus on mindset? How we see people. Every value should link back to seeing people as people. He said, sure, show me what you would do. So here I am uh, from the Maori village at a $3 billion company um, asking, how, what can I do to help? Take ownership became be the legacy. Earn trust became be pure. I remember one of the vice presidents saying to me, Seamus, make sure they're not too churchy. I said, what do you mean too churchy? He said, that sounds like Gordon B. Hinckley. I said, he didn't say, I said, he didn't say be pure. He said, be clean. <laughs> but then I also said, what's wrong with being churchy? You made $3 billion last year. He said, we get criticized and we get critiqued all the time for being a Mormon company. And I asked him again, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. You're going to be blessed. We talked about being pure, and I said to him, he said, how are you going to teach that? I said, well, there's an oil called Abo Vite. And for the native people, that's the tree of life here in the United States of America. It's used to purify bad feelings. It's used for smudging in buildings to take away um, contention, bad spirits. We're going to use the oils to teach us. We're going to use wintergreen where the people of Nepal greet you with namaste, which literally means, I see God in you. And all the oils that the company has have values that belong to a people that surround peace building. Be empowering, be curious, um, be leader focused and be customer obsessed. Why be? Because being is often a lot harder than doing. Because it starts with insight. Um, I, uh, I'm going to skip over all of this because I just got the one minute mark. I apologize. But all through the cultures of Polynesia, there are values, there are proverbs that teach us from the language, the mindset of the people. But I'm just going to get to one. Sorry, Dr. Kahili. Our people weren't just warriors, but we were men who honored females as well. The Tongan people remind us of that. 
there is a saying that we've heard a lot here, and I'll end with this. Um, our people were peacemakers in the Pacific. These proverbial statements remind us of that. The bottom one, should you take the tender shoots of the flax bush, it will die, and therefore where will the bellbird live? And if you were to ask me what's the most important thing in the world, it's people, it's people, it's people. So I go back to our quote, the best place to start is where we are, and your people, my people, we're peace builders. If we can help the world see that, share that, then we know um, that we're making the world a better place. I, uh, it's appropriate in my culture, I sing a song, but I can't sing. So I, uh, what I, if I can get this to work, you might need to change the battery, so, uh, Alrighty then. <laughs> Thank you to uh, all you beautiful souls who are here. I want to begin by giving honor to those who welcomed and host us here today, to those ancestors and spirits who inhabit this place and who we brought with us, to the craftsmen and women who created this beautiful place for us to learn peace. As Peter said to our Lord, Lord, it is good for us to be here. It's pleasant to talk of peace as we have the past two days and as we will this morning. But I think it's important to take a moment to remember those who suffer from its absence. The women, children, and men of Ukraine, millions of whom have been driven from their homes and the tens of thousands of whom who have been killed, sometimes in horrific fashion. 
This is in addition to the four other ongoing wars that have claimed at least 10,000 direct violent deaths in the past year around the world. In Afghanistan, Yemen, Myanmar, and Ethiopia. And the 38 other armed conflicts that rage around the world. The victims and their families of the senseless rash of mass shootings in this country, most notably in Buffalo, New York, and Uvalde, Texas. While we've been meeting here this week in this place of refuge, four people were killed in a mass shooting in Portsmouth, Virginia, and three others in another shooting in Smithburg, Maryland. In the roughly one minute I've been talking, an average of 24 people in this country will have been victimized by rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. This equals 12 million women and men each year. So let us pray for all these victims of violence and the countless others I've not named. As we sit here in this peaceful place, my heart's heavy. I don't know this, and I hope that I'm wrong. But I think there's a very real chance that we may see an outbreak of serious violence in the United States later this month. If, indeed, the Supreme Court issues a ruling about abortion rights, like what we saw in the leaked draft, I expect that frustrated outraged elements of the political left will take to the streets and violence will ensue. That may well spark counter-violence from the political right, where certain extreme elements have been normalizing the concept of violence as a political tool for several years. I hope I'm wrong. But we may be in for a long, hot summer that, that could equal or exceed that which we saw after the murder of George Floyd two years ago. This, sisters and brothers, is why this conversation is so necessary. This is why Jesus came into the world. This is why Jesus called us to be peacemakers, to help us heal a fallen, broken, violent world. According to Restoration Theology, humanity's original sin was not eating a piece of fruit. That was a foreordained and courageous act by Mother Eve that helped progress God's plan of salvation. No, our first sin, which truly alienated humans from one another and from God, was when brother killed brother. Several generations later, as violence proceeded unabated, the prophet Enoch saw a vision of God in all creation. In the midst of this epiphany, Enoch witnessed God weeping. How could this be? How could the Lord of all creation weep? God answered, Unto thy brethren have I said, and also give commandment that they should love one another, and that they should choose me, their father. But behold, they are without, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. They are without affection, and they hate their own blood. We are promised that at some future day, God will wipe away all our tears. But for now, our tears of sorrow, frustration, hurt, loss, and trauma flow into a mighty river of grief, joined by God's own tears. As President Spencer W. Kimball lamented, we are a warlike people, easily distracted from our assignment of preparing for the coming of the Lord. When enemies rise up, we commit vast resources to the fabrication of gods of stone and steel, ships, planes, missiles, fortifications, and depend on them for protection and deliverance. When threatened, we become anti-enemy instead of pro-kingdom of God. Our weeping parents are calling their children back from the precipice. God has given us in these latter days the Book of Mormon with not one but two reminders that violence begets violence 
and unchecked, it leads to civilizational holocaust. Give thanks unto God, the last Nephite prophetically wrote, that he has made manifest unto you our imperfections, that you may learn to be more wise than we have been. Today we'll hear from a number of practitioners of peace who are wiser than the Nephites were. David and I wrote a book. That's important. Ideas matter. But our goal all along was to inspire readers not just to think, but to go and do. Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peace believers or the peace thinkers. It is the peacemakers who reveal what it means to be a child of God. If proclaimed peace accomplishes one thing, we want it to be this, to convince Latter-day Saints that peace building is their inheritance, obligation, and privilege. At the, at the outset of World War I, the deadliest conflict the world had ever known to that point, President Yosepa taught, for years it has been held that peace comes only by preparation for war, but peace comes only by preparing for peace. We love all the swag that's been created for this conference, but renounce war and proclaim peace is not just a slogan. The August 1833 revelation makes clear that this is an immutable covenant that God offers to us if we want to inherit his glory. For if you will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy of me. Proclaiming peace is part of the covenant path for all Christians. As we begin this final session, I pray that each of us goes forth from this conference with the spirit of peace burning deep in our hearts, with a desire and commitment to live up to our covenantal obligation to be peacemakers. We're about to hear concrete examples of what that looks like. May we each take that inspiration and then let the spirit guide us how and where to go next. Thank you. I, I love to hear Patrick speak, and you can see why this has been a rich 10 years. Maybe that's why it took 10 years. I just wanted to drag out this association as long as possible. Um, it is a really sacred honor to be um, in this place of refuge and to feel that sense of refuge and to be in this, um, in this house amongst the ancestors. Um, I've always envied those who have the gift of feeling the presence of the ancestors. That has not been my gift. But events over the last several weeks, there have been two moments where I have felt the ancestors that gift has come, um, and one of them is today. And I, um, I know they are here, and I know that we cannot build peace without them. Uh, Forty years ago this week, I was uh, off the mainland for the first time, uh, here in Hawaii for the first time, here at the Polynesian Cultural Center, uh, and the spirit that I felt here was extraordinary. Um, as a 14-year-old kid, uh, turning 15 that week, <clears throat> it was a wonderful um, introduction to a world that I have only c come to appreciate how, uh, how vast and beautiful it is. Uh, three years ago, I had an opportunity to return. Uh, uh, the first time since I had been here as a 14-year-old to teach at BYU-Hawaii uh, for a semester. I was a visiting professor, uh, but I was really here to learn. A couple of things happened that were really special to me. One was an opportunity to, to share a draft of the book 
with the students and to get their feedback. And that this book is it's an infinitely better book because of what they shared in that classroom. So I was here to learn how to, how to, how to write a better book. <clears throat> I was also here to learn how to be a peacemaker, a peace builder. Um, I had the great privilege of sitting in on Chad Ford's class uh, in Intercultural Peace Building 121, the introductory course, but the course that challenged me more than anything was David Whippy's class on mediation, where for the first time I was learning how hard it is to move from talking about principles to trying to actually implement principles of peace. Um, since then, I have been trying to learn to be a better peace builder. And for the last three years, I've been volunteering as a mediator in the court system and at BYU um, Idaho's housing office. And I have learned how bad of a peace builder I am, <laughs> as has been shared often. Um, and I'm, but I'm learning. And so uh, what I am looking forward to now is learning from those uh, who have such vast experience in peace building and in the hard, hard work of taking principles and putting them into practice in real life situations. I know that the ancestors are here today, but I also know they have been with those who have built peace and will are ultimately uh, integral to any future of peace that we might be able to build. And so um, you've heard plenty from Patrick and I. I am eager and, 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 and excited to turn the, uh, uh, the stage to those who know, who have been in the trenches and know, uh, and know how to do this work and who can teach us how to do that work. Thank you. Yandra Vinaka and Bula. At the outset, I wish to recognize and pay my respects to the indigenous peoples of Hawaii as the traditional custodians of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. Today, I feel extremely blessed with a huge sense of gratitude and appreciation to be able to be here in a very special and sacred setting. I wish to thank Seamus and Kim and the Maori Village team for the warm welcome and for inviting the spirit, but also acknowledging the spirit of our ancestors and the role that they play in our journey of peace building here on earth. So thank you for giving us an opportunity to add and share a special part of our peace building journey here in your intimate space. And I hope through my sharing, I do justice to the sacred setting. I also wish to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers and, of course, Patrick and David for all your hard work that's gone into the book. It has, helped, it has allowed me to read and reflect on the work of peace building we are, as, we are involved in as an organization, and most importantly, I am involved in as a female LDS peace builder. So thank you for giving me a part, an opportunity to be a part of this special event. Now, peace building in Fiji with a diverse and context that I'd like to also acknowledge. I am of indigenous Fijian, meaning Itauke heritage, and I also have Indo-Fijian blood, or if I'm being politically correct, I am Fijian of Indian descent. I also have direct paternal links to an island called Rotuma, which also belongs to Fiji's jurisdiction. I was born and raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'd like to think that 
I'm still very young and have a lot more to learn in my journey of peace building. So currently, I'm also building my wealth of knowledge and experience in local peace building in Fiji through, of course, my learnings in spaces that I've had the privilege and the blessing to experience through not just my employment, but also my diversity. Now, the context in which I work in back in Fiji, we gained independence back in 1970 from Great Britain. And since gaining independence, we have had a series of political instability. So we've had four coups and these are illegal overthrows of elected government. 1987 was the first bloody coup, which they reference as one of the worst coups in the history of Fiji, and that was the year that I was born, born during a coup. So born into the church, but also born into conflict, or conflicting time. In 2000, we had a civilian coup. 2006, we had a military coup, and in 2009, our constitution was abrogated. So Fiji is rife with conflict. When I initially had seen the program and the concept behind this conference, I, I first asked myself the question, am I a peace builder? How exactly am I contributing to the work of peace in Fiji? And growing up, I've always imagined the work of peace building to look at you know, people mobilizing around violence or war and standing up against it. And it was a concept that the church was actively involved in, building peace, building wards. So in the earlier part of the book, there's a clear distinction made between negative peace and positive peace. And it allowed me to reflect on my work as a peace builder and contributing to positive peace. The Apostle Dellen H. Oaks is quoted in the book in saying, peace being more than just absence in war, absence of war, sorry, but positive peace refers to a state of affairs in which justice, equity, and, abiding, and an abiding commitment to the common good is built into the very structure of society. Positive peace connotes harmony, wholeness, shared prosperity for all, and of course there is no peace without justice. Additionally, in the Just War Theory chapter, he goes on to teach that there are many individual church members who are actively working to reduce human suffering or to promote understanding amongst different people. Latter-day Saints around the world are engaged in interreligious dialogues, refuge resettlement, various forms of diplomacy and sustainable development initiatives. So as I reflected on these bits, I said, you know, okay, if we're going by President Oaks' definition, I believe I qualify as a peace builder in the work that I'm doing. I currently work and lead an organization called the Citizens Constitutional Forum. The organization was born out of a conflict, which is the 1987 illegal overthrow of our elected government. So the organization has been around for about three decades dealing with conflict, managing conflict. The vision of the organization is really to build a nation in which Fiji's people live together in equality, justice, and peace, respecting the law under a constitution that guarantees democracy and human rights. Our mandate is really human rights, advocacy and education on Fiji's constitution, so all around Fiji. We look at areas of transparency, accountability, and good governance. Now what this actually looks like on the ground is spending days in local communities and villages and also in formal settlements around Fiji, sitting on a floor and teaching citizens about the rights that they have in the constitution. And this gives us the responsibility immense responsibility to then ensure that communities priorities are then reflected and pushed into policy making spaces and it is such a hard job to work with structures that are so set in their minds and ways of doing things but it can be rewarding in yesterday's session, Sister Akano and Brother Whippy touched on the LDS culture and traditional culture. Now, when we teach the concept of human rights in Fiji, many communities deem it as a foreign concept. Foreign in the sense that it is almost entirely new and is deemed to you know, sort of award Fijians with almost a set of superpowers um, that they kind of were not aware of that all of a sudden they have and can demand from those around them. And this is the feeling because we grew up in a very patriarchal society and the environment that we grow up in does not 
teach you to question your elders or we, we, they teach us to, res to pay respect and listen to our elders, chiefs and leaders. So questioning is not something that we're trained to do when we grow up. Then you have the concept of human rights, emphasizing you know, freedom of expression, opinion, and thought. So when we're teaching this in communities, we have to be really careful that we are not, we are not contributing to any misunderstandings. Yesterday, there was a discussion about whether or not church culture could be woven with traditional culture, and I do strongly believe that there are many synergies that can be harmonized. And they must not impose on each other, but rather embrace and acknowledge the context and the diversity that exists. Dr. Kaili on day one also touched on time. For us in the work of peace building in Fiji, context is an important aspect because it shapes our commitment, but also actions to the mandate of pushing for positive peace. Context really does shape our strategies of peace building. So when back 10 years ago in Fiji, you could get up and uh, create a, mobilize people to get together and stand up against, you know, the low minimum rate. Today we need to get a permit. You can't be seen with two or more people, so we have to be working within, within a context. When entering local communities on the ground, we are very aware of cultural protocols, but also the manner in which local communities manage their conflict. Our strategy when engaging with communities is really to help enhance their capacities to manage conflict, conversation, and most importantly, relationships that need to be maintained. So it really is looking at what exists, how can we strengthen this. It does not disregard any locally generated and owned solutions that communities have been working hard to build and maintain over the years. Yesterday, Ben Cook spoke about sustainable peace and diplomacy in two tracks which he identified track one as transactional and track two as attitudinal. Much of our work is bridging attitudinal change or local communities to transactionally or elected, the transaction uh, track with elected representatives and leaders and policy makers. We educate and, ed and advocate over a period of time where we consistently provide direct support and mentor to build capacities of local communities to be able to engage with policymakers. Genuine relationship, we, over the years, sorry, we have learned just how important building relationships with local communities and stakeholders are. Genuine relationships built on trust, mutual respect, and understanding. Our organization in Fiji, unfortunately, is seen as the watchdog of government. So you can imagine trying to manage and keep a relationship with the state. While we can do and provide support to policymakers, for example, provide human rights lenses when, when they're making laws, we strain this relationship if we speak on other issues that the state may be falling short in. And I like what the book states in the chapter, A Political Theology of Friendship, which says, while living in anticipation of Christ's eventual millennial kingdom, we can still offer our current political com communities from the local to the national and even, even global level, true friendship and all that it entails, mutual interest, genuine care, commitment, sacrifice, hope, and yes, love. And at the same time, deep friendship includes a willingness and even a responsibility to call out bad behavior. Friendship is not blind allegiance. It adds a restoration text that articulates the notion of being subject to the state and offers an alternative political theology of friendship where such friendships does not require the follow of Jesus to condone or participate in state's violence. I have been able to reflect on peace building in our line of work, which is really about managing relationships, both with local communities in Fiji and the state for the collective good. I must admit the operational part of managing these relationships require patience, understanding, humility, Christ-like love, all of which I can credit to my upbringing in the church because the job really does not teach you that, but rather it throws you in the deep end and you either sink or swim. I was fortunate and blessed to have gone through BYU, Hawaii, 
and today be a living testament of the vision of the school, which is to prepare students of Oceania and the Asian Rim to be long life disciples of Jesus Christ and leaders in their families, communities, chosen fields, and in building the kingdom of God for them. And also the vision of BYU in preparing men and women with intercultural and leadership skills necessary to promote world peace and international brotherhood to address world problems and to be a righteous influence in families, professions, civic responsibility, social affiliations, and in the church. The experience here at BYU, along with the spirit and my diverse upbringing, culture, and being born in the church has molded me into the young leader I am today with so much more potential in the area of peace building in Fiji. This is a testament that there is space to merge and weave cultural and traditional and tradition if done carefully with patience, understanding, and Christ-like love. I will end here, and I believe we can engage in question and answer later. Vinaka. Aloha everyone and kia ora. Um, I was asking Seamus yesterday what uh, a proper greeting would be and he, and he shared with me um, tēnā koto, um, which is uh, a greeting of I see you and I acknowledge you. And uh, we, we, we mean that to, to this special place, to all of you, um, to Matua Kiem for, for us being able to use this space. Um, this space means a, a lot to me as does BYU Hawaii. I, I was privileged to spend a lot of time in this village with with Chad teaching Arbinger to to Seamus and to Kim and and I, I learned so much here uh, it makes gets me emotional being here the principles that I learned here um, from Kim and the others uh, will stick with me forever um, so I'm just blessed and grateful to be here uh, my name is Chris Pineda these are uh, wonderful colleagues and, and fellow alumni of mine, Kasha and, and TK. And we're excited to share with you a little bit about what we're doing um, in the Pacific Northwest. We're going to talk to you a little bit about groundwork today. Something that we all have in common is we all graduated, obviously, from this wonderful institution. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we have a shared vision, and it's President McKay's vision. Uh, to be an influence for good and spread peace uh, throughout the world is deeply, deeply in our hearts. Um, and it's one of the great um, blessings of my life to be able to do this work with people sitting behind me that share that vision. If I could, I'd, I'd take every single um, alumni and field director in this room with me. It's a great privilege and blessing to do this work with people that have that vision. Um, it's amazing. Uh, Salem, Oregon is where we're at. And a little bit about Salem before we'll, we'll show you a video about a little bit with what we do. Uh, it's the capital of, of, of Oregon. And there's political divides, there's racial divides, there's homelessness, there's poverty, there's all sorts of challenges that are there. And we've tried many attempts to engage in that, been successful, been unsuccessful, but what we've been doing the last few years is something we call groundwork. And this is a little bit about groundwork. Play it. And 
most importantly, it allows people to share their leadership with others. And, and I find that to be truly, truly unique. Uh, but when we're talking about soil, we're talking about people, manifestations of it. The soil part is what we always come back to. If you have good, healthy soil that includes people that see each other, recognize the humanity in each other, their human beings, needs, spheres, inadequacies, you name it, just like us. If you think of a wagon wheel, somebody spokes to it, there's a lot of spokes missing in our community when it comes to leadership. And so how do you provide that? How do you fill the gap? And so if we can provide a simple framework like the Ruth Leadership Framework, uh, mixed with the language and the camaraderie that these people can share in our hope. All right, that other gentleman in the, in the video is Salam. He was actually going to come with us, another colleague of ours. Uh, he's an amazing individual. Uh, as you see in the video, you know, we've made big strides in becoming very intentional and formal in our, in our efforts to peace build. And the way we have a vision, our vision statement is to be a catalyst for transformational change. And we don't, we don't believe that we are the transformational change. We just feel that we can do a good job at creating conditions for that change in our community. And this is how we define transformation. This is how we define transformational change, a fundamental shift towards positive potential that includes how we see, think, and behave differently. And everything that we do, decisions that we make, everything we offer to our community and these leaders we work with is encouraging them towards this positive potential and how they think, um, behave, uh, and see differently. Uh, and a key element of that is the rooted framework, which TK is gonna, gonna share, share a little bit more about. <clears throat> Not quite as tall as Chris. So yeah, we wanted to share with you a little bit of what we actually teach both leaders in our institute, but really anybody in the community that wants to come and learn about this. And this is our framework around how leaders can be a force for transformational change in their communities. Um, so you'll see as we go through this, I should also mention, you heard in the video, we call this the rooted framework and we use an analogy of soil, seeds, and weeds, kind of an agricultural metaphor, both to help leaders kind of see how all these pieces fit together into one whole, but even more so to create a common language for them as they come together to learn about this, both to understand community organizational problems, but also so that they can then collaborate together uh, better on them through that common language. So we're going to go through with we'll you uh, just what we call the master diagram again of our rooted framework. Goes over the four main elements that we go. So first, you can see up here we already started on it. We have outcomes. Every organization has outcomes. It's the goals. It's the mission, the vision that they have, and we help leaders identify what their purpose, their organizational goals are in the beginning. And so in our analogy of soil seeds and weeds, we call this the the fruit. It's the fruit of our labors where we're ultimately trying to create the impacts. So you might think, you know, as I'm, as I'm explaining this all to you and we're going through this, you might want to also think about how does this apply to your own organization, your own work, what you're doing? It doesn't have to be peace building, but what are the outcomes that you're striving for? And, you know, we might even think in the context of this conference, uh, you could think about this in your ward, you know, with just ward theory. What are the outcomes that you're trying to strive for in your ward? So anyway, so we have outcomes which are our fruit. And then we say, in order to produce those outcomes, we often just have ideas, a theory of change. If we do X, it will produce Y. Some idea around what we could do, some program or project that we can implement to produce that fruit or outcome. And so we call that the seeds. We plant the seed in the ground. It grows into a tree, which then produces the fruit that we ultimately hope to harvest. So you can think again, what are the seeds? What are the programs, the projects, the ideas that you have that you're implementing to try to produce those outcomes? Alongside our seeds, we have conflict. Obviously, in peace building, we talk a lot about conflict. We specifically are talking about inner organizational conflict. For most people, this is an inhibiting force. This gets in the way of producing our fruit. It takes time, energy, resources away from our seeds and uh, makes it more difficult to produce that fruit. And so we try to help leaders understand how to transform that. In the context of this, we call conflict weeds because we ultimately, you know, we try to weed them out, remove them from the ground. Uh, beneath all of this, we have people. We learned today people are the most important thing. People give meaning and underline everything that we do. People come up with ideas. They implement the programs. People are the ones who engage in conflict. And oftentimes, especially in peace building, our fruits even are oriented around people. And so we call people, or we, in our analogy, we relate to people as the soil. 
because everything we do is rooted into the soil. And we'll talk a little bit, Chris will talk a little bit more in a second. We talk about healthy soil versus toxic soil. You heard a little bit in the video. Chris will talk a little bit more about what, and show you some images of that in an organizational setting. So that's kind of what we call the master framework. We teach leaders each of these four elements. We spend hours on each of them, teaching them tools, strategies, around how they can implement these things in their own organizations, but even more, largely speaking, in their communities. Alongside it, so this is, again, this is kind of just organizational. You just organize your work. What are my outcomes? What am I working towards? What are the programs, projects, ideas I have that are working towards that? What conflicts might be getting in the way? Who are the people who are involved? That's just how we organize our work. We, say, we go along with this and say there's two ways we can approach this framework. And so the first one of those ways we call being surface-minded, which we define as just going through the motions. We've probably all experienced this in some aspect of our life, if not work, where when we're engaging with the seeds, the programs, projects, we're just going through the motions, doing what the bare minimum to maintain the maintenance of it. When we're in with weeds, we talk a little bit more about conflict avoidance and conflict management, how we just, you know, we don't want to deal with the weeds, the conflict, if we don't have to, but if we need to, we'll just deal with that surface layer. We'll chop it off at, at the stem so it looks nice. Um, and, and we contrast being surface-minded, which we also think about a lot as being transactional. We just deal transactionally with these different elements. We contrast surface-minded with being deep-minded, which we define as being purpose-driven and as opposed to transactional, being transformational. You can see soil reappears. When we're deep-minded and purpose-driven, people are often our purpose. And so we're deeply mindful of other people. We're accountable for our impacts on them. But we also see deeply ourselves and our own personal sense of purpose. We deeply see and are deeply minded about our projects. What is the ultimate purpose? Why are we doing them um, so that we can best produce those impacts? And then we're also deep minded about our weeds and we try to see the potential in those conflicts to be, so that we can transform them. And ultimately, we, we, in this framework, we believe that as leaders strive to be deep minded and apply this framework, they can be forces for transformational change, both in their organization, but also in their community. Thanks, TK. Uh, we have over 18 hours worth of curriculum, and TK gave you the th three-minute version. Uh, so I want to just emphasize, you know, we had to pick a niche. What's our niche in our community? Where are we going to enter? Where are we going to do this work? And I think this framework is a peace-building framework that can be used in many different settings. We've chosen to work with leaders um, because leaders have decision-making capability. They create structures. They create systems. They have power and they have influence. And we want to leverage that to make a difference in our community. Specifically, we start with executive level, director, director level leaders of all different sectors. So here's an idea of the sectors that we work with, uh, at least how we, you know, what we call them. The business community, faith community, education, government, nonprofit, and even uh, with the uh, uh, general public. And over here on the right, you see toxic. I would say that uh, this is an example of what a toxic community looks like. Uh, in some communities throughout the world, people literally go to war and kill each other, right? In our community, it's, it ends up being very transactional, political war warfare, ideological warfare, right? But it becomes toxic, and at the very least, it's transactional. And our goal is to create a transformational community where interactions, healthy interactions, are happening all over in different sectors. And it's amazing what's happened already. It's just been a few years, but amazing things have happened and are happening. And Kasha is going to share a little bit about what, what that has looked like and what it looks like today. All right. Um, I got to talk about the coolest part, which is what we actually do. Um, and so, like Chris mentioned, with our community members, we really try to grab a diverse group of leaders. Um, this means different backgrounds, different diversity. Just to give you an example, some people have been in our cohorts. Um, this year we have like a county commissioner. We've also had the chief police of, um, of Kaiser, which is a neighboring town. We've had um, assistance to the superintendent of the school district. We've had high school teachers, um, executive leaders of nonprofits. Um, we even last year had a monk, a Catholic monk, um, who ran on energy drinks. And it was super fun. Um, but, and people like me, right, who are still new. We have leaders who are, have years of experience and also leaders who are just starting. Um, and once we kind of gather all of these leaders together, we start off the year with a three-day retreat where we introduce them to the framework, to soil, seeds, and weeds, have them apply it to their organizations. We um, also have them really build relationships with each other. A lot of times, this is the first time these leaders are in the same room with each other. And we even have leaders that are on opposite ends of political arguments, uh, opposite ends of community issues. Um, it's the first time they're in this room together and we really try to be intentional about 
creating space for them to learn and engage with others. And after our retreat, we then spend an entire year, we have monthly sessions where we spend all day together. Um, again, we start those days building relationships. We really want our leaders to not just see each other as these objects or tools of how can, I, how can you help me get what I want in the community, but really, who are you? Um, what's hard? What is hard at work? What is hard at home, right? Uh, we really want our leaders to see each other. So we start with building relationships. We will have them engage with um, we'll have our alumni come back and sit on panels. We invite well-known leaders like Chad Ford to come and present to them. And we also have them work on community problems of practice. So we identify different community problems. And this year our cohort is working on mental health, um, city livability, um, uh, homelessness, and workforce readiness. Right? And we have them apply the framework to those problems and they engage in it that way. And we also, outside of those cohorts, we have them meet with mentors. So every year they're meeting with an alumni and helping them connect it to their, to their organization, um, as well as do personal growth plans. So they're being, being very intentional about their growth. Um, and so that's kind of our year and it's all really exciting, but the most exciting part is kind of what happens after people graduate from our cohort. Um, that space that was created and those relationships that were built really inspire our leaders to go off and do great things. We've had a group of our cohort members um, start an alliance to eradicate children and family homelessness. Um, we've had a leader that was um, inspired to start an initiative that helps young people have healthier relationships with their phones. Uh, we have a high school teacher that started a class to teach um, teenagers how to see people as people. Um, it's just been really, really amazing to see all of the work and effort that has been done in our community. And that's what we feel is really creating the conditions for transformational change, is our people. Thanks, Kasha. Kasha also has a hard task of explaining all the amazing things that have happened in just a couple of minutes. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can scan this QR code. It takes you straight to our website. There's a lot more information. We have a podcast with 60-plus episodes, thousands of downloads. Seamus has been a guest on there. Chad's been a guest on there a few times, and um, it's been amazing. Uh, you know, a couple messages I just wanted to leave um, with, with all of you. Uh, you know, one is, is for the students and faculty here at the school. Um, you know, I encourage you to, to think about President McKay's vision and something Chad told me a long time ago. Um, don't see yourself as a type or version of person that he saw. See yourself as the person that he saw that would go out into the world and be genuine gold and make a difference. Um, that's made a difference in my life. It's guided every decision that I've made, and it's not always been easy. Uh, but it's, it's one of the most important things that I think you can do, being a part of this wonderful institution. Um, and for everybody else, practitioners and guests that we have, and then even students, we're able to do this because of a wonderful philanthropist that writes the bill, and uh, somebody that we shared McKay's vision with, and that he fell in love with. Uh, and he has a saying, being somebody that gives so much, uh, it goes like this, it's you make a life by what you get. You make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. And uh, if all of us can go back out into the world to continue to give to this, this quest of peace, to proclaim peace, the world's gonna continue to be a better and better and better place. Um, and uh, with that, you know, I, I share again, um, as, as Seamus shared with me, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Mahalo. Good morning and aloha. <clears throat> My name is Adrian and I'm from Hong Kong. Um, first of all, I want to, I feel very welcome here. Um, especially I'm grateful for David and Patrick for putting the book together because it's very rare for an Asian student come back and to present. And I'm also grateful 
to see all the all my professor from my peace building program Chad, David, Amanda, Seamus and they're all wonderful people and they taught me who I really am. I graduated uh, with a peace building degree and uh, three years ago in 2019. Oh, before I continue, you can look at the screen instead of my face because I have a lot of great pictures. <laughs> so I graduated with my wife uh, three years ago. Uh, she's in a different major. And I'm glad my parents was there to witness that. I also want to introduce my parents, Jimmy and Joe. Although they're not physically here with us today, um, I see them as the true peace builder. In my last semester of uh, peace building course, my final project is about the 2019 Hong Kong movement. And the poster here, the picture was taken uh, when two million Hong Kong people were protesting on the street. And this is fascinating. The movement got really intense between the civilian, the government, and the police. It's a vet everyone in Hong Kong. There are conflict everywhere, on the street, home, workplace, school, social media, in the church, even in the BYU Hawaii campus. So I decided to open up a workshop for people to have conversation and share their opinion. So there were about uh, 30, I would say 25 to 30 people, students, to join my workshop. The meeting eventually lasts for about two and a half hour until the custodian kick us out. I treasure this opportunity. As Patrick and David mentioned in the past two days, we all have different ways to proclaim and spread peace. Writing books, just like that. Teaching in school, giving out a workshop, taking care of people who are in need. For me, this is facilitating and training to create inner peace among individuals. I'm a strong believer of inner peace. One of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King, peace is not when the summer sky is clear and the sunshine is scintillating beauty. The peace of which Paul spoke is the calmness of soul amid terrors of trouble, inner tranquility amid the howl and rage of outer storm, the serene peace at the center of a hurricane amid the howling and joistling winds. Again, I'm a strong believer of inner peace. As David and Patrick talks about the importance of personal peace, it is not that easy to achieve world peace. We need to create inner peace and to family peace. From family peace to community peace. From community peace to country peace. And finally, that we can achieve world peace. After I graduated, I went to Singapore to get certified as an Arbinger facilitator. And we learned a lot about corporate training and I did a lot of Arbinger training with my family members, even though some of them, they refused to sit down for five hours with me. Oh, I forgot to mention, today I have my sister over here. Uh, you can find someone that's holding a camera for 15 minutes. And she's a student over here, and she's taking a peace building certificate. Well, I just peacefully recommend the certificate to her. I didn't force her. So Jimmy, my father, especially, sensed the importance of conflict resolution in the current states of Hong Kong. Therefore, they started an organization called the Millennial Family Institute. The Chinese name uh, over here, the, you probably won't see, and you probably won't understand either, is called Chai Ga Hot Yun, which comes from a Chinese idiom, Sao San Chai Ga Ji Ping Tin Ha. In translation, 
cultivate oneself, bring order to the family, govern the country, and bring peace to all. After we have a discussion with Chad and Amanda, uh, sorry we didn't uh, well, get your approval for that, but <laughs> here they are. <laughs> we started a project called Zero Contention. Uh, you may be familiar because President, uh, President Nelson and Sister Wendy Nelson, they are strong believer, or they are the one who suggests the zero contention. We use content from the Developing a Work Mindset and the book Dangerous Love from Chat to facilitate people from Hong Kong. Our objective is very direct and easy. Create harmony and peace among family. Hopefully in the future we can adapt, proclaim peace in our training too. And we look forward to that. In the past three years, we focus on three areas church, corporate, and community. You know, when, when I make this slide, I was like, that's pretty much everything, <laughs> you know. So let me start with community. We had a lot of community work um, during these three years. We hold over 100 lectures uh, in the community basis. So the very first service that we did, we call the International Family Day. And my parents introduced parenting, conflict resolution, and Alfred Adler theories on how to form a family. I would love to share one story about a father. He worked in a higher position in the company, and he was folding his hand the entire lectures, I mean the workshop. And when we're suggesting communication skills are very important with your family and with your coworker, and then he challenges. He said, well, Sometime in a workplace, uh, if someone is not efficient or productive, we will fire them. We will we'll not allow them. Well, we agree, um, and then we kindly address a question to him. Can you fire your son? Next, I want to introduce another NGO. It's called the SOCO, the Society of Community Organization. Uh, it's one of the biggest uh, NGOs that help grassroots family in Hong Kong and it's established, founded uh, 50 years ago with uh, 6,000 grassroots family and over a thousand single parents and over around a hundred SEN family. Uh, we found that many parents or single parents from Hong Kong are incapable to play with their children. You may wonder, well, that's an easy, easy task. I can play with my kid every day but it's not like that back home. We believe playing is a big part of communication. Most people we work with are the grassroots in the society. They have lower education, lack of resources, so they come to SoCo and we provide different workshops to all of them. And this up the picture. My parents find, they found a great bonding with the people over there, and at the same time, they found their purpose and vocation when they're helping this family. This is the Koda Hong Kong, the children of deaf adults. So Jimmy and Joe has a few courses over um, the teaching about parenting and also uh, with the deaf parents. One of the major challenges they face is that they're children, which they're, they're not deaf, um, they refuse to learn sign language. You know, that's, that's a major concern because if you don't learn sign language, well, you cannot really communicate with your parents. And without communication, or just simply have a, having a chat, it's really deep down, they cannot have a great relationship. Let me go faster. So these are the other workshop. Let's go to corporate. Uh, this is uh, a lot of my work has been done uh, in corporate. Uh, we have a, a different conflict resolution workshop uh, with a lot of people, uh, especially financial advisor team, insurance company, etc. 
And I'm using the principle and activity that I learned in this program to share with the people in Hong Kong. Uh, one great project that we work with is called the Salvis, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, real estate company in Hong Kong. We share about positive communication skills and how to transform conflict in the workplace. Uh, we continue to work with uh, lots of corporate team. It's a very dynamic team. There's over 40 members uh, in here from 19 years old to 50 years old. So another great project has just happened actually last month. We are able, or we have a chance, to have a conflict wrestling workshop with the Hong Kong airline. Uh, we focus on conflict resolution. Uh, they love the idea of collusion and dangerous love. And they have a lot of concern and questions concerning to uh, dispute with their clients and also their colleges. And lastly, church. We see a lot of opportunities in the church. This is a group of YSA from Provo, uh, learning about our work mindset. And we also got invited by the stake and several land department and to teach about zero contention. We had around uh, three bigger workshops last year. Not only non-member, also members need to learn how to communicate with their family. And this is uh, another project that we did last month. Uh, it's, uh, we're teaching family from mainland China. And this is the one to call dissect a family and build zero contention. I want to extend a little bit uh, with people that we work in China. The people we talk to in China has a very limited knowledge on maintaining relationship with their family. The parents' main focus is to make their kids study and get a good grade. The kids' goal is to impress their parents. When two didn't achieve their goals, conflict can easily occur. One reason is the oppression, in my opinion, is the oppression of family dialect. There are certain ways for us to respect our parents in Chinese culture. We don't really open up ourselves to, to our parents because more of the time, we need to abide with what our parents want, and this is the culture. The relationship between parents and children is like boss and employee. Chinese people focus a lot on production. Building relationship takes time. Building peace is not productive to them, and they become an obstacle because it's not productive. Therefore, you can't find any proclaimed peace or any peace workshop or conference in Hong Kong because they are just simply not productive. If we look at the map here, well, you can't really tell by the map, but Asia is the biggest continent. I just found out two days ago. It's the biggest continent in the world. The population uh, is about equivalent to 60% of the world population. China, Chinese culture, is just one culture. We still have many more Asian culture, Japanese, Korean, Indian, Philippines, Vietnamese, Thai, with so much more to bring peace to this country. Let me conclude my presentation with a story. I don't want to uh, spoil um, with the peace building student here, but this is one of our last activity in 480. So one day, Chad told us to wear something casual, and know, I know something is gonna happen. So we went, went out to the classroom, and then we went to the field outside the library. You know, he showed us the difference between weeds and real grass, because they they're exactly look the same. And he told us, you need to pull out the seed in order to get rid of the entire weed. And then he told us to try get one out, okay? I was like, okay, where's the tool? And he just looked at us. Also, okay, so we're using our hand. I went to the curb and find a shorter weed, you know, just try to get things done to impress my professor. So I carefully dig in with my hand inside the soil and start finding the seed. When I reached the first seed, I was like, well, this is easy. When I try to pull it out, there's another force on the other side of the seed. So I was like, Okay, I continue to reach to the bottom. I found another seat. When I think it is all over, there are the third one. I remember yelling at Ch Chat. You know, that's not happened a lot in, for Asian students. I yelling for Chat for calling for help. He just told me there are maybe more than one seat at a time. 
Remember to, to, to pull them all out, otherwise they will just grow more seed. Thank you, Chad. There's a Chinese saying, family shame must not be spread aboard. Chinese history and culture is very deep that people are afraid to talk about conflict. My wish is to hope we can overcome the culture and the fear. Be brave and persistent. Start with yourself and your family. May we pull out all the seed of the week. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Don't you just love these youth? Oh my gosh. Um, from this school, sorry. Oh, I forgot about this. Okay, thank you. From this school, I'll tell you, will go men and women whose influence will be felt for good toward the establishment of peace internationally. The vision of David O. McKay, the vision of Dr. Chad Ford, our professor and friend and colleague. I am a byproduct of that vision. And I'm thankful to be here today, um, thankful for the opportunity to read a book that just energizes me and gives me hope, and to be amongst these youth that are absolutely phenomenal, and the faculty, um, my professors, um, Tavita and Chad. So I'll start from there. A new commandment I give unto you. Oh, I forgot about this thing, sorry. I'm not technical. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. I absolutely love that scripture, and it moves me to tears every time. But it is much easier said to read it than to actually do it. I was taught as a young girl by my parents and reminded of it at BYU Hawaii and again at Eastern Mennonite University at the Center for Justice and Peace Building to pray. To pray not only for guidance, but to pray for the people that you work for. To pray to learn to love the people that you're working with. And that's not always easy when you're working with people who have slaughtered in every kind of horrendous way, who have raped and maimed. But I can tell you that the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of love, can teach us all to do that very thing. Now, I work, oops, sorry, I worked in Nigeria, and I'll just briefly talk about this so you can ask questions later. Nigeria is divided by six geopolitical zones. I worked in five. And primarily, I worked in the Northeast, where Boko Haram um, crisis occurred, the Niger Delta, and the Middle Belt. But I want to talk about um, the Middle Belt specifically. So the Middle Belt deals with conflicts of religious, political, and ethnic divides, also farmer, herder, and land disputes. But it's kind of like a woven mat, and they all interweave and affect each other. And you've seen that here in our own country, how a political divide turned into a religious divide. Sorry, I'm having to do both. So specifically, I want to talk about Plateau State um, and Riom local government, which is an LGA. Um, and I worked on the farmer herder crisis from 2013 to 2019 while I also worked on other crises throughout the country but continued to work on this specific one. 
And the goal of the project that we worked on was building an architecture of peace. Um, and the way that we did that is with this vision of teaching people to see humanity in each other, to honor dignity, um, how dignity violations lead to or can lead to violent conflict. Likewise, how honoring dignity helps to restore um, humanity. And then this idea of a higher love to approach conflict. And I can tell you today, as being a byproduct of BYU Hawaii, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and also the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding, that these are theories that I learned in my upbringing and in this education. And so my boss gave me the ability to be able to try new things, and that's what I did. Our professor, um, Tavita, taught me in applied anthropology not to take the solution into the community, but rather go to the community and harvest a solution. And so the way that we did this was doing this. Uh, as I mentioned, we work with farmer herders. And uh, here, right here, is uh, Rayom. Uh, LGA is a tiny little LGA who has suffered astronomical violence and conflict and in the worst possible ways. And the reason I am talking about this particular local government is because I met a man there who was like a father, like a brother, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And I will tell his story in a little while. We worked on uh, multi-track uh, diplomacy, meaning right from the community, one-on-one, -on -one, um, community leaders, NGOs, all the way to the state and the federal government. We can't talk about Rio without talking about uh, our beloved farmers. And so I love this picture. Um, in Rio, we have three primary farmer tribes, um, and the tribe is Biram, Atin, Attacker. Biram and Attacker are friends. They work together. They have strong working relationships. The Atin, not as much because they're stronger ties with the Fulani, but yet they're still build bridgers. Build, building bri bridge builders? Yes, sorry. So I want to stop here for just a second. Nigeria is the most populated country in the African continent. It has over 200 million people. It has nearly 300 ethnic groups and over 500 languages, including English, because it is a commonwealth. So you can see how complicated um, conflict can get. The next we have here are Fulani herders that are nomads. The Fulani herders can either be nomads, semi-nomads, and nomad settlers. Nomads are the people that are coming in from Chad, from Sudan, Niger, Cameroon, and Nigeria, and they're grazing all over West Africa. The semi-nomads are those that live in the country, but they graze all over the country. And this is very important to note because they graze on farm lands. And then we have the settlers who have settled in Nigeria, who have been there for generations and generations. But because they're not indigents according to the state, not the Constitution, they don't have the same rights as the farmers have. Now, the farmer herder conflict has left thousands of people dead. and hundreds of thousands of people displaced. Properties, homes, farms, animals destroyed. So how do you learn to love your enemy? Pride gets in the way. This idea which we've been hearing throughout the conference that you'll be viewed as weak. In a dialogue that we held, a Samoan dialogue process that I love, that I learned right here at BYU Hawaii, with 30 people, they had over 500 loved ones killed in an attack. One man lost 18 family members. All his children, 
grandchildren, his wife, and his brother. So you can see how revenge plays a part in this, right? Reprisal attacks. They want a revenge for honor. They're so highly traumatized that the individual alone is not the only one traumatized, but you're dealing with whole groups that are traumatized that are acting out either against self or simultaneously at others. So Proclaim Peace says this, among the most difficult, if not the most difficult of Jesus' teachings is his injunction to love your enemies. No command goes against the grain of the natural man or modern social training more sharply, making it both counterintuitive and countercultural. One of the hardest decisions you'll ever face in life is choosing whether to walk away or to try harder. We did much of our work through building relationships from the ground, whoops, sorry, um, from the ground up. We, hang on a second, I got that message and now I'm nervous. Uh, so working with women groups, bringing tribes that are warring together, tribes that were so afraid to meet, they thought that they would be ambushed but they had the courage to do it community leaders that we taught to, to, that we worked with one-on-one. -on -one. These are our many dialogues that we did to go back and teach families to change this culture of violence because people had been born into it, the youth. Traditional rulers, this is a picture of me with all of the traditional rulers of the tribes that I mentioned. These are the traditional rulers and religious leaders of the Fulani tribes that they told us we would never be able to work with, that they would never accept us. And here I'm doing some work with them on trauma, and anyway, you can see they accepted us. <laughs> we taught them that a leader that leads with love has the power to transform a nation, and that you don't have to be called as a leader or have a title as a leader to be a leader. You just have to love your people. Community leaders that we trained, love is essential to leadership. We couldn't stop at the community, so we trained the entire House of Assembly. We held dialogues with them because we had to have policy change because of structural violence. Sorry, I don't have my glasses. Rather than feeding the fire of violence, we need to extinguish it. In the midst of active violence, we need to find ways to secure a negative peace so that we can work toward positive love. Active, assertive, even confrontational love. Love is a powerful agent that extinguishes rather than flames of human violence. Now, I hadn't read that book, and I didn't even know the authors, but I guess we come from the same gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what we taught. Lema, who we heard about yesterday. Leadership is standing with your people. People say you have to live to fight another day, but sometimes you have to show you are a true leader. Now, I have a very short time to tell this story, so look at the pictures, and I'll try to tell it quickly. After seven years of hard work, at this point I think it was six, the, the farmers and the herders are together here um, in dialogue, in friendship, and taking care of each other. We had a crisis in 2018 that in the period of three days we lost almost 500 people. None of the people from our villages that we worked in died because the leaders that you saw they were doing their piecework. However, I went to an imam, the disciple of Jesus Christ that I absolutely loved, and I took him by the hand, which you're not supposed to do, but he's kind of like a dad to me, or was, and I said, imam, promise me that you'll never stop preaching peace. We need leaders like you. Three weeks later, he was preaching peace in the mosque after prayer and he was assassinated. 
for preaching peace. So we decided to go to his village and pay a condolence trip. So here we are, a tin Fulani and Biram, and myself, a foreigner. And the road was so long and so far that we had to trek. Three months before we made this, or two months, I forget, eight people had died on that very road. So my colleague said, Emma, they're going to kill us out here. I said, if not, the tribes are our boss for being out here and not letting them know that we came out here. So you can see how far we trekked. And when we arrived, there was a small little room. And leaders had come from the Fulani tribe from the neighboring villages. And these were the top of the top, including their religious leaders and including the imam son who's wearing white. This is a place where women never enter. This is a village where no Biram attacker or a tin tribe man or woman had ever entered, let alone a foreigner. So I address them. And I said to them, I'm not here on a peace-building tour or visit. I'm here to pay you condolence. I'm here because we loved the imam, because as a Christian woman, he's one of the best Christian I've ever met, and he was an imam. And it's my fault that he's dead because I made, I made him promise me to preach peace, and he did, and he was killed. And I'm so discouraged that I just want to walk away from this idea of peace building. And the congregation started to speak in a nutshell. And the leader of the group stood up and he said, we will put down our weapons Every leader in this room will go back to our villages and we will tell our people not to take up arms. That the, that the imam did not die in vain. And whatever tenant taught you to love so deeply that you would walk into a village that, where you could be assassinated is the kind of love that we want to be known for. And then they prayed for us. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them to hate you, that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew, the Quran. Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love and whatever you spend indeed, Allah is knowing of it. And the work continues. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause to those amazing peace builders. We're not done, um, but we are going to take a quick break. Um, we have some refreshments outside, uh, and uh, we're going to take, we're running a little bit behind, um, so we're going to take a, a quick 10 minute break. Um, one, one request, uh, this is a sacred space, um, and so please eat our um, refreshments outside. Uh, do not bring in um, the refreshments um, back um, inside. Um, and when we come back, we're going to um, be able to do a Q&A, um, and, and I've prepared some uh, closing remarks uh, about um, uh, what I've learned um, at this conference uh, today, uh, this week. Um, and so uh, we'll break right now for the next uh, 10 minutes, and then we'll uh, rejoin the conference. Huh? Uh, please be back at 1040 uh, in your seats. Thank you. And the refreshments are outside, right outside here.
Well, we look forward to uh, now being able to uh, actually do a QA. and um, I think the plan right now is uh, we're going to we're going to skip discussion and, and open up the audience. We've got a lot of students here, professors, lots of different people, uh, and, and we hope hope that you'll have uh, questions for uh, our panelists today, including Seamus, if you have some. Um, about the work they're doing, or about the challenges that they face, or the progress that they're seeing, what, whatever it is they, they, you're interested in, we hope uh, uh, we give a few minutes to um, ask the follow-up questions that you have. Um, are we going to have a, a, a mic in the audience? A actually, just talk loud, mic. Okay, Sydney's, Sydney's going to do it. Sydney's got the mic in the audience. And uh, just uh, please direct your question to whoever uh, you'd like to talk to. Melissa's up first. Thanks so much for those awesome presentations. How do you decide when to sit, tell someone to stop doing what they're already doing and do what you want them to do, which I think I heard, and, some, and then and, um, when you should just stop saying what you're saying and change to reflect them, right? There's like, I, I've heard in, in almost all of your presentations that kind of, um, you know, we have this practice we like to introduce and we like to have you do this thing and then it will change your life. And then in other ways, you come in and, and you like see what they're doing and then you kind of work with what they've already got. And I've heard both kinds of things. How do you like make that distinction between not being an imperialist and whatever the other word you've got is I'm confused right now? Pink. All right, who wants to take that one? <laughs> Hey, Emma, Emma's, Emma's going to take it. I can take it. Uh, I love that question. And I was lucky because I had the training like right from the get-go here. Um, but I think for me, it wasn't about getting them to do what I wanted them to do. It was about helping them to see humanity in each other. And we did that through dance. Everything we did was culturally identifiable, meaning even the clothing I'm wearing comes from that those tribes. The shoes I was wearing were made from the people there. So learning how they dress, learning you know, what's important, how to honor elders, and then creating a safe space like the conference is done where people can actually <coughs> tell their stories. And once they start hearing their stories, it changes the way that they start viewing people because they see that the people that are telling stories have experienced similar accounts that they experienced. So I'm not sure about everybody else, but that's but it took years. Um, I would say similar, you know, relationships. Uh, spent three, before we formed Groundwork, you know, three plus years of just building relationships and then individuals in that community that are from that community, like Brian Moore here, he's here today, I'm so glad he's here, building relationships over time so that when we come into a community, which isn't our own, none of us are from Salem, um, we have relationships of influence to be able to, to leverage. Um, and I would say I'd do the same thing if I went to another community. I would find Brian Moores, I would find individuals like that that have relationships and have influence and work through them um, to, to, in order to, to uh, get an audience, if you will, or to have an impact. So it, it all came down to relationships and then being willing myself to reveal some of my own humanity um, also. Emphasize so much seeing others' humanity, but equally we have to reveal our own to other people. I, I want to hit up Seamus with this question as well because I, I see this unique opportunity of uh, a rare turn of events where the Pacific is now colonizing Utah uh, and Doterra. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and he's bringing these ideas, uh, and it's really important part of what you do. So I'm curious how, how that's gone. Um. I don't know how cool it was. We are 0.1%. We're not even a percent in Utah. The Polynesians, I love it. I'm really looking up there. Um, I think it, the idea that always comes to my mind is that people want to belong. And so taking, when I come into doTERRA, I'm trying to find out how do we get people from all over the world, 4,000 employees, to belong to doTERRA, to own um, not only the product, but own the values of what the company stands for. And the beautiful thing at doTERRA is that you have got oils from all around the world. 
And so the idea we put forward was that is don't just extract the oil and use it to make money. But that oil belongs to a culture, it belongs to a people, and that therefore is our culture. And it resonated with everybody. That, right, like I mentioned wintergreen. Um, one of the main products of Deep Blue, which is one of the main products of doTERRA, the, the Nepalese people, when they greet you, when they say Namaste, they are literally saying, I see God in you. And people, I think mean, everybody here can understand that that's something that I like, to, I like to belong to because I believe that's what my grandparents taught me. My grandparents taught my ancestors that the legacy of taking care of people. And so that's kind of the idea. The idea was people want to belong, they want to own the values, they want the company to succeed, and so give them what they want. Help them recognize that they actually have it. And doTERRA have one of them. And we did the same here at PCC with, with Chad. Now, I, I, I gotta share one thing is that when I took the role at PCC, I didn't know what to do. So who do you call when you don't know what to do? Call Chad. <laughs> when I got to doTERRA, who do I call? I call Chad. <laughs> Chad, can you come to doTERRA? And he did in February come up and um, did our, our very first leadership symposium on dangerous life. Um, and people can own that. And now we associate that with the values that come from the cultures that the oils belong to. I don't know if I answered your question, Melissa. What if there's something in the culture that's fairly harmful? Like, like what it is, that's something the culture fairly, you see it's fairly harmful, like the caste system in India. And they say, sorry, we really love this caste system, we work people, and like it's really working for us. Then what do you say? Take that? Let's let the person take that. So thanks for the question. So just building on the conversation, for us, relationships is really the foundation that we build um, you know, our trust uh, with communities. And it's not going in and telling them like, hey, you need to do this, but it's getting them to understand the same vision or the um, the, the good that's going to come from it, from it if you adopt um, this way of doing things, and also taking into account you know the traditional ways of people um, you know addressing conflict conversations and um, managing relationships. So while we while we go in, we are very aware of that um, that you know they've been dealing with conflict for longer than I've been alive. Um, so it's really a um, a place where we also provide support. So we go in and we stay with them for quite a bit of time and then they adopt it on their own. So it's more of a sustainable move towards making that change and it's not from like you need to do this. I hope that was. I, I want to interject something too, just briefly, okay. if it's okay. I think for me, um, I somehow really fell in love with Nigeria and I fell in love with the people and the various tribes and languages. But I, I I think, to remind me your name, Chris, you know, uh, they need to see you too. And, and I think for me, because I am of Latino culture, Mexican, uh, at least 48% Mexican, which is a dirty word in the United States, to be quite honest, and even in a lot of part of Latin America. And so I understood what it felt. We had caste systems too in Nigeria. So I had an understanding of what it felt to be in the out and then a woman in peace building and a Latter-day Saint woman in peace building. And, and so I think that using your own experiences and connecting you to the people um, in a really kind of holistic, pure way helps. And does it change everything? No, but it's a step. You know, it's a start. All right, thank you, Emma. Uh, let's see, I saw Fred Axelgar back there with his hand up. Thank you. Um, it, one of the questions that's been on my mind the last few days has to do with time and the perception of time, the use of time. And it struck me when we began today thinking about bringing our ancestors together that, and the way Emma, you just said a minute ago, take the last phrase you said, and it takes time. When we talk about sustaining, uh, we, our, our goal is to build relationships that need to last. All of this involves time. And I thought, how do you as young people 
deal with time. It isn't, it isn't, um, when you're young, you have a different appreciation of the need for things to take time. But it, but it struck me that maybe bringing ancestors together changes the way that everybody involved thinks about time. It, it works on your patience. I'll stop there. I hope it, it, time is an essential ingredient in everything you've talked about, but haven't talked directly about it. So I'm gonna Jenny, you call him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand the mic to Adrian, um, who's in their early infancy of a, of a program and starts start thinking about family, but also thinking about larger scale, and also, I know, in the Chinese culture, ancestors and time. Um, when we work with uh, the community, it's really related to the list of questions too. It's cultural and structural values. The, the Chinese culture is just so deep that when you talk about time, people talk about thousands of thousands of years. And we all know Chinese history is all written for a long time. And the people that we're working with, they a very study. And for me, I thought having one workshop, if not two workshop, or not five workshop, that may, you know, they start to change. But not, that's not the answer. I, re, uh, I know my parents, they work with a family for three years. And they're still, according to them, a mess. And for me, you know, right now, for younger generation, I mean, we're all young, but for young generation, <laughs> we, we love fast food. You know, everything quick, fast. You know, for me to come over to Hawaii, I'm not saying people are slow, but they're generally <laughs> more like that. Okay? And I live in a city. And people who walk in my city, city you, you probably think they're learning. <laughs> so that's my perception of time. And for peace, uh, I remember there was one article about uh, in, in peace building, we call it the long short way and the short long way. And for me, to build peace is a long short way. We cannot take uh, uh, what we call a uh, uh, shortcut, right? I hope, I hope that answer. Yeah, we actually only have time for maybe one, one more question, so it's uh, any other Hands that are up, oh, like that. Like that. Um, Sydney, Alexa. This is one of our peace building students. Um, oh, okay, this is for the alumni. How did you get started in what you're doing? I think for us, a lot of us going into peace building, it's kind of like going into psychology, you can do a lot. Um, how did you get started and what put you on your path?
which um, I thought, who doesn't want to go live in the woods with a bunch of angry teenagers? Um, ended up being the best job I've ever had. Um, and then I ended up working for a gap year program that took me to South America and working with young adults that way. Um, and and then I ended up working for Arbinger. Like I just I feel like I was given a lot of really great opportunity, but I had to say yes to it, even though it was scary and it was. Um, I didn't really know where it was going to take me. Um, and honestly, going, coming to Hawaii was one of those yeses that I had to say yes to. And then the state connected. Um, I texted Chris on his birthday, randomly. Um, well, it wasn't random, it was his birthday. But um, I texted him and just said, hey, Chris, happy birthday. I always thought just very highly of you, and I hope you're doing well. And his response was, thanks, Kasha. Um, Arbinger's hiring, do you want a job? <laughs> um, and I really do think that it was um, the relationship that I built. I didn't even know Chris thought I was that cool. He was just like the guy that I did peace building classes with. Um, but he's sung my praises for lots of years and he's the reason, he's one of the reasons. I, I give him a lot of credit, but people will push it back on me. He's just a very strong reason um, that I am where I am today. And that wouldn't have been the case if I hadn't been fostered that connection and relationship. Welcome. Yeah, I feel like my advice is going to be really similar to Kasha's. Uh, Chris is a trail of, trailblazer in peace building, and I think a lot of and, uh, and, uh, and the rest of us as well. Uh, I, I feel like I'm similar to Kasha, but uh, Chris is, Chris is trailblazing, uh, provide opportunities for me, obviously. But, but I think, kind of, to build on what Kasha said, I, I think. Not only staying connected, but, but getting connected. So, uh, if you know what you want to do in peace building, it's mediation, facilitation. I also do, in addition to this, evaluation. Um, I, I, I finding someone else who is a trailblazer in that, or who is just in that field, and asking if they'll mentor you, asking if they'll help you. Uh, not only do you build a connection there, but then you also build knowledge and skills. And, and in my experience, this has been with Chris and with others, that people are genuinely, absolutely very generous, especially if they're from the McKay Center and from the Peace Building Program, they're very generous in wanting to actually mentor and connect you. Um, so I, I think there's that, and I think the other part is just, it, it's better to do something than nothing. Even if, if you know exactly what you want to do, and you're finding, oh, this is stopped. Oh, I have one minute, so I can keep <laughs> Let me just distill this pearl of wisdom down for you. Um, yeah, it's just better to do something than nothing. Like, if, even if you are doing exactly what your dream job is in peace building, if you can find anything that's connected to it and just start working there, um, it's better to do that than to be waiting around for this perfect ideal. Not that you're doing that, but uh, perfect ideal job. All right, let's, have, let's give it another round of applause. to the captives, 
and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. When he concluded his brief sermon, the congregation was first astounded and angry. The account ends with them casting Jesus out of the synagogue and attempting to throw him off a cliff. There is no record of Jesus ever returning to his home in Nazareth. Again, that's a tough way to start a ministry, a movement, a world-changing life. Biblical scholars have given numerous interpretations as to why the congregation was outraged at him that day. I am persuaded by John Henry Yoder's interpretation. Christ's message that day in Nazareth was an audacious one. Jesus spoke of peace, of hope, of justice, of forgiveness and reconciliation at a time when his congregation was suffering deep, intractable, violent conflict. The people of Israel were being crushed by the Roman Empire. They were the Messiah to fight, not love. Jesus was calling for something that most of us fought fail at miserably when we are meshed in conflict. The call was to turn first, to minister to the wounded spiritually, economically, and socially, to let go of our grudges and animosity, and to show forgiveness to those that hurt us, and to do everything in our power to make things right for those we have hurt. The acceptable year of the Lord, he refers to, Yoder believed, was a call for jubilee, a commandment given from God to Moses on Mount Sinai that was rarely, if ever, followed by the ancient Israelites. The Jubilee is about renewal, reconciliation, and shifting our mindset that acknowledges the hand of God in our lives. It was a call to restructure and restore the relationships among all people. It was an ecological response to the challenges of an interdependent world, and Christ was going to lead the way. Alas, today, when we speak about Jesus, we rarely talk about that message in Luke 4. Nor do we talk about what happened to Jesus that day. It is as audacious today as it was back then. And the audacity of Jesus' message, of course, doesn't end there. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Audacious. Love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Audacious. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Audacious. Ye have heard it that it is said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of judgment. Audacious. Ye have heard that it has been said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye would resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus said, I say not unto thee until seven times, but seven times seven. Verily I say to you, insomuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. He that is without sin cast the first stone. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. As I have loved you, love one another. By this shall men know that ye are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus had the audacity to spend his ministry with the poor, the destitute, the outcast. He audaciously mended the brokenhearted, delivered those in captivity, healed the blind and set liberty to those that were bruised. He had the audacity to deal in an olive grove in Gethsemane and bleed for every poor to atone for the sins of people who reject him over and over again. He had the audacity 
to take upon him our infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor us according to our infirmities, the audacity to be beaten, crowned with thorns, forced to drag a cross up Golgotha, nailed to a cross by soldiers, gambled beneath it. Yes, the message of Jesus is an audacious one in a world such as this. Isaiah correctly prophesied he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid, as it, and, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jesus' path to building peace has either been ignored or rejected by many, including Christians and Latter-day Saints, some with the same virtual of the people of Nazareth that day. For those like me that stumble on the path of Jesus' way, the justifications are plentiful. His way can or won't work in the harsh light of the broken world in which we live. The world is broken, and Jesus' call for love and reconciliation and justice lack the power to transform such a dangerous world. The peace spoken of by Jesus and the prophets appears in the harsh light of reality to be more aspirational than practical. It resides in the future and far away from the sorrows of this world and life. Human beings are incapable of living peaceably together. At the end of the day, the natural man always wins. Our only response is to endure it. And even I can concede that not all humans are incapable, are, are ca incapable of loving one another, but the ones I'm in conflict with, they're definitely not. You don't know my spouse, child, boss, rival political party the way I do. I often find myself saying when mired in conflict, people may be able to change, but them, they'll never change. I have also felt overwhelmed by corrupt socio-political and cultural systems that set us up for failure. The system itself is rotten, rigged. There can be no peace or justice as long as they continue to stand, but I don't know how to tear them down. It seems more satisfying to condemn the wicked and tearing down structures that keep them in power than learning how to love and forgive them. Yes, in the middle of an unjust world where violence Inequality and prejudice run rampant, where shooters are opening fire in schools, where countries like the Ukraine are being violently invaded, where so many hate their own blood. At times, I felt like it's not enough for God to be. I want him to fight. Or at the very least, I want to fight on his behalf. I have been one at times in that congregation in that Nazareth feeling that the message is too audacious and it's not enough. As someone who has dedicated his life to teaching and practicing peace and following Christ too often, my heart has been at war where I felt hopeless against the stampede of hate. To renounce war and to proclaim peace in the midst of the hardest, most complex, or long-lasting conflicts of our time is audacious. Proclaiming peace has not been, nor will it ever be easy. The cost of following Jesus, is, uh, following Jesus as the Moriori learned, doesn't always come with a happy ending. If we are to renounce war and to proclaim peace like Jesus, it will be inconvenient at best. And for some, it may cost us our lives. Those with the courage to follow Jesus will be despised and rejected by a world unable or unwilling to believe there is a better way. There will be pain, sorrow, and hopelessness at times. Conflict, duality, and difference will not, despite our best efforts, disappear in this life or the next. Our pre-mortal cosmology begins with a war in heaven and describes a weak in God. I deeply understand the pessimism of peace with so many relationships at home and in our community seem so broken and unrepairable. I understand the temptation to believe that peace is something Christ brings us in the next life, not something that is possible here. This is certainly a story that can and needs to be told. We need to acknowledge our fears and doubts to be more self-critical 
and accountable for our struggles personally and collectively to follow Jesus. And in doing so, I and we need to embrace the principle of repentance and the gift of Jesus' grace. However, this is not the only story of the followers of God. Yes, we often fail to be the peace builders Christ calls us to be. However, in closing this morning, I want to acknowledge a cloud of witnesses, both our ancestors and our modern day pioneers who have walked or are walking, however imperfectly, the audacious path of peace that Christ set before us. Elder Neil A. Maxwell once stood here in Laie and said this, all who have had much experience serving as change agents in society realize that before change can occur, one of the most essential elements is the existence of a convincing model. If people feel something just can't be done, they are unlikely to attempt it. Even small models, though, can be great guides because by small means the Lord can bring about great things. And he was referring to this place as one of those models. I want to acknowledge a few of those people who have provided for me and others a convincing model of peace. There is a tradition in the Middle East with a group of Israelis and Palestinians that I work with that when we are acknowledging our ancestors or the living that are digging the wells from which we drink, that we acknowledge our respect, our gratitude by offering them a single reverent as I speak of these people that have been such a great inspiration to me and others, I invite you with me after naming them to offer them a single clap if you feel so moved to acknowledge them this morning. In doing so, I borrow the language of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed be Enoch for having the audacity to overcome his fear his young age and lack of eloquence to partner with God to build Zion, a place where people dwelt in righteousness, where there were of one heart, one mind, and where there was no poor among them. Blessed be Esau, who had the audacity to forgive his brother Jacob, having, after having his birthright taken away, prompting Jacob to remark, In you, I see the face of God. Blessed be Abigail, for the audacity to rush out to meet an angry David, prostrating herself on the ground, begging for forgiveness for the actions of her husband, and in turn saving hundreds of lives, including David's. Blessed be the anti nephi Lehi's, who have the audacity to bury their weapons of war into the ground and have the courage to see their enemies as their brethren and to meet them on the battlefield, not with anger, but with love, and to my knowledge, showing us the only instance of war in the Book of Mormon that ends with the aggressors repenting, dropping their weapons, and converting to become peaceable followers of Christ. And blessed be the Moriori for giving us a powerful historical example that courage, and showing us the courage that the anti nephi Lehi showed in the Book of Mormon is possible today in our world. Blessed be Joseph Smith. For the audacity to not only usher in the restoration, but for receiving the revelations in section 98 and 121 that remind us that God commands us to renounce war and proclaim peace, and that the powers of God can only be exercised by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge and charity. Blessed be Emma Smith for using the knowledge of the restoration to found the Relief Society that followed Christ's admonition to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to serve the least of these. Blessed be President Russell M. Nelson, who prophetically testifies audaciously that peace is possible, and for asking us to end the conflicts that are raging in our hearts, our homes, and in our lives. He's asked us to bury any and all inclinations to hurt others, and to do what we can to help the distress and to seek the Lord's help in ending any major conflicts. Blessed be the Kanaka Maui, the indigenous people of this land, 
in the original, original inhabitants of Laie, who have audaciously endured the colonization and at times genocide of their people with a Mohawk, and for their commitment to the motto, Ua Mea Ke Au Kaina Ikapono, to setting things right by restoring the life and sovereignty of the land. Blessed be President Kaule and Vice President Isaiah Walker and all of the people of BYU Hawaii who have supported this conference and the Case Center for Intercultural Understanding and the Intercultural Peace Building Program with them the audacious idea that our students can and should learn the doctrines, theories, and tools of peacemaking. Blessed be Spencer Fluman and the Maxwell Institute for their audacious commitment to giving a platform for LDS scholars to explore and write about the theology and practice of peace, and for their support to make this book and this conference a reality. Blessed be David Pulsifer. For his audacious lifelong support of the ethic of nonviolence, and for the example both his scholarship and his life give us in stimulating our moral imaginations and for creating the first ever peace building program at BYU, Idaho. Blessed be Patrick Mason, who spurred my moral imagination as a young faculty member 15 years ago when he wrote the audacious possibilities of Mormon peace building and who has been a tireless advocate for following the example of Jesus Christ above all else and for his work creating a peace building program now at Utah State. Blessed be Melissa Inouye, who just a week after receiving cancer treatment that would likely keep most of us in bed for a month, made the audacious choice to fly here, putting herself at risk so that she can teach us what it means to love our enemies and take the risk of embrace over the easier path of exclusion. Blessed be Adam Miller for having the audacity to approach the theology of Christ with creativity, humor, and humility, and the passion in the way that has edified so many of us over the years and helped us grow closer to understanding his truths and that perhaps our bodies do not have to eat, or do have to eat in the next life. <laughs> Blessed be Ben Cook for the audacity to pioneer peace and conflict resolution at BYU, the law school in the Wasatch Valley. His leadership there is transforming the way that the university and the people of Utah are thinking about conflict and peace building. Blessed be Kim Makakao for welcoming us into this Marai, the spiritual center of the PCC, and for having the audacity to come to my office a decade ago with the most humble of requests I want to change, and in doing so, changing the hearts and minds of so many others here at the Polynesian Cultural Center and BYU Hawaii. Blessed be Seamus Fitzgerald for the audacity to change the culture at the PCC in a way that more accurately reflected the founding principles and teachings of the Savior of both of our institutions, teaching us the wisdom and peace-building skills of the Maori people. He aha, te mea nui o te ao. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. Blessed be Tabitha Ka'ili for his leadership as our dean and for the audacity to insist and advocate for that our knowledge of peace needs to be decolonized uh, and the truths of the indigenous people of the Pacific be recognized, respected, and understood. Blessed be Christina Akanoa, for the audacity as a political science professor to engage with us peace builders here and to teach us that our way of seeing the world is not the only way and for sharing the beautiful practice of Nkoma as an example of how justice can be restorative instead of destructive. Blessed be Eliza Elkington, who did not hear from today, um, but who has taught our keiki here in Laie and in Sunset for the past two decades, um, and has taught them the basics of peace while peace building between angry parents um, semester um, after semester. Blessed be Miss Lucretia Hussein for the audacity to lead the people of Fiji, both indigenous and Indo, away from polarization and division and toward a space of collaboration and harmony. Blessed be Chris Pineda, Kasha Coombs, and TK Ford, and the Mountain West team for the audacity to take 
what they learned here and develop a program that is truly changing an entire city of politicians, teachers, law enforcement officers, clergy, and the people of Salem. Blessed be Adrian Chan and his father, James Chan, for taking the audacious step of being a pioneer peace builder in Hong Kong. To Jimmy, who's not here with us tonight, for literally changing professions so that he could support his son and what he learned here. And to Adrian for the courage and creativity he has shown in adapting what he's learned to work in his home country. Blessed be Emma Billings for the audacity to step in the middle of violent conflict in Nigeria and risk her life for the last decade to, be, to bring peace to people that she loves. Blessed be David Whippy, a former rap star in Fiji, <laughs> who had the audacity to leave behind a career that could have brought fame and fortune and take up the cause of peace, both in Fiji and here at BYU Hawaii. I don't know of anyone who more accurately embodies the vision that President McKay had about our alumni than David Whitney. Blessed be the students and alumni of BYU Hawaii who have made the audacious choice to study and practice peace building despite objections from parents, ridicule from classmates, and much hand wringing over how am I going to make a living at this? Thank you for choosing to live into the motto that stands outside our campus, enter to learn, go forth to serve. Blessed be David O. McKay for the audacious vision 100 years ago that if you brought people together from all over the world and taught them Jesus' way, that they could become, as he prophesied, influences towards the establishment of peace internationally. This is the second time this has happened to me here um, in 16 years. Here. I feel his presence here with us today. And uh, I hope he can look down on all of us here. The many peace builders throughout the world who are and say what Jesus did at the beginning of his ministry in Nazareth. This day, this day, is the prophecy fulfilled in your ears from the school of men and women who will be influences towards the establishment of peace internationally. Blessed be Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. May he change our stony hearts into fleshy ones. May he give us courage and wisdom to follow his path. May he give us the strength to love one another so that by this shall the world know we are his disciples. May he help us make a way out of nowhere.